This is Thoughts Become Things. With each episode, we'll help you reach the highest creative potential that God has for you. With your host, a teacher, life coach, a dream coach, and motivational speaker, Jeremy Lopez. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another podcast of Thoughts Become Things. I'm Jeremy Lopez, and so excited you guys are with me today on this amazing Wednesday morning. Maybe you're listening to this in the future, or maybe nighttime, but hey, either way, good day. Hope you're having a wonderful day so far. And you know, I'm really excited because as many of you guys know, the first of the month always excites me the most because I have that hot off the press monthly book club. And Many of you are already on the program, and many of you should be on the program. Because what I do is I release a really good, big size, thick book every month for those in the program who get free shipping, a free ebook with it, uh, sent to your house, autographed, all that amazing, fun stuff. But I'm excited because I love to write. I really do. People ask me all the time, how on earth? I mean, some people have one book out a year. How on earth do you write a book every month? Well, I have what I call a cheat sheet, and basically is I love to talk. And so a lot of my books come from transcribing my teachings that I do every month. And then what I do is I sit down, write the outline, then I begin to write the book. And so I have editors who sort of bring in their uh their grammatic uh uh, we'll say fixings, for lack of better words, a southern term we can use, and sort of correct everything that needs to be corrected, and voila, there it is. And so, have a little help from my friends, as, as the old song once said. And I'm excited because this month, I always pray about what to be able to write on, and what I like to write on are things that I know a lot of my clients said that they're in need of, or really what I see the need of within the world, within humanity, and, and, and the church as well. And I think a lot of times we, a lot of times as Christian authors, what we do is we get too, I'll say, cult-minded in the sense of we're always writing books that pertain just to the body of Christ, just to the church people, you know? But the truth is, that's wonderful and great, but we should go in and out. You know, one of the things that I like about the book of Revelation is when it deals with one of the chapters that deals with the angel, and it says uh, in this dream that, that John had when he was called up, you know, and that was that he had one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. And if you think about that in, an, in a way of interpreting that, what this, is, what this is representing is you should have one foot in the, the the world, the secular world, not being part of the world, but being in the world, and the other part in the church. Why? Because guess what? Everybody can benefit from peace. And once you know who the peace is as a person, it even makes it better, right? But everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to be healthy. You know, it's not like because one person is a Christ follower, we want them healthy, healthy, but we don't want anybody else healthy, right? So, so I think the idea here is not making things exclusive, but making things inclusive. Because you know what? The Bible says that, that God God so loved the world. There's so many scriptures where God so loved the world. It never says God so loved the church. And and so, so because of that, I'm not here for the church, folks. Really? Oh my God, shocker. I'm here for the world. I'm here for humanity. Because the kingdom of God, the Bible says, is within us. And because of that, I want to be able to have people to benefit benefit from the writings that I feel like God's given me, right? Because let's just face it, I don't want us for no more. A lot of people are into us for no more. I'm not into that. I'm into I'm into the I'm into the God still of the world. I'm into people, humanity. Because everybody hurts, everybody feels pain. It's not like we're here as Christians, we feel pain and the world doesn't. You know, I mean, come on, you know, it's the idea that everybody in this on this planet hurts, we have sadness, happiness, we rejoice. We all know what it's like to be abandoned. Can I get an amen from the choir? You know, we all know what it's like to be rejected. We all know what it's like to be happy. And so guess what? There's a circle, certain sort of consensus of every person on this planet. And so I want to reach everybody with messages that can be able to not be exclusive, but be inclusive. Because that's a kingdom of God's message, right? And knowing that, it begins to, to, to take that. Let me just say this before I start my message today. It takes it further into that amazing parable that Jesus talked about, which is what, you know, when he mentioned, Hey, you know what? Let's, uh, I'm going to invite my friends and my family members, you know, and, and I got this big palace as a king and I'm going to invite them. I'll have a great party. Well, guess what? None of them wanted to come. So even his quote unquote exclusive mindset, 
you know, God was trying to let him know, your exclusive mindset is not going to work for me, right? Because none of his friends and family members came. And think about what this, what this parable is talking about. Because it's really just so blunt and so right in our face to say, you can't afford to be exclusive. You can't afford to have Christianese language. You can't afford to have just us for no more. And if you're not part of me, then, or part of what I believe as a Christian or the church I, or the denomination I have, and you, know, you can't be a part of maybe my world or my life. And yet, and yet God looks at, takes this parable and like slaps us in the face with it and says, okay, so they don't want to come here, right? And so because of that, he invited the outsiders. Dun, dun, dun. You know, isn't that considered to religious people evil and bad? But yet to Christian, to true Christian folks that really understand the kingdom principle and process in the sense of knowing the message of the kingdom, we want to take it to the outsiders. And so he invited the outsiders in. It's funny he didn't even go out to the outsiders. He invited them in. I always love that. And so he invited them in to his place. Oh, we can't communicate with those ton of people, Jeremy. Well, guess what? Then Jesus really needs to get a brain because he doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, I'm being, I mean, I'm being real as I possibly can. If that's the case, if that's what you believe, when yet Jesus was like, I'm telling you a parable. Get the outsiders to come into you, into your world, into your partying, right? That's exactly what he said. They were having a party, not a Bible study. And so they come into this world and, and come into his kingdom and he, and they celebrate him as he celebrates them. So the understanding is, we have to look and realize that, you know, my ministry, my books, my teaching, it's not for just a couple of people. I'm not in the cult. Okay? I'm not into the cult of Christianity. I'm into, I'm into the kingdom manifestation of Christ who loves the whole world. And that's the place where I want to be able to be that I'm reaching out to is let's take a message that everyone can benefit from. Right? Because if we don't, we become exclusive to basically come up with our own language, which we've already done that, come up with our own terminology, which we've already done that. Then before long, we're like, are we really Christ-centered or are we cult-centered? That's the, that's the key. Are we church entity or are we kingdom entity? Right? Big difference, folks. Because a lot of times we don't stop and look and listen to what we're actually living out and what we believe. And if our belief, here's what I love. If, if my belief, and this is an old meme that I don't even think a Christian wrote this, but here's my belief too. If my beliefs block out anyone, then I'm gonna go, I'm gonna stay clear of that belief. If I, if my religion blocks out anyone, then I'm in the wrong religion. I won't be a part of it. And I won't. Because the quote unquote, for like the words of the religion, the, the, the quote unquote religion that I believe in is one who loves the world because he created the world and includes all the world. And that's the key thing. And, and don't get me wrong when I say this. You have to know the difference between the original Aramaic and Greek language when it deals with world, which represents not being part of the world, which doesn't mean the world itself because you live in the world. It means the world system. That's what it means, and there's a big difference. So when you look at that and you say, we're not supposed to be part of the world, the world are not people, folks. Listen, the world is not people. The world is not cities and traveling and being a part of things. But the, what it means is the world, in the, in the translation, means the world's system, the systematic way in which it, which it runs. And that means I'm not part of the system. Now, it says we live in the system, but yet we don't have part of the system, which means my faith and trust and hope doesn't rely on the system to provide for me, take care of me, or whatever. Because do I trust the system? Not really. But yet I, tr but yet I trust humanity in the sense of being part of humanity, understanding more of that the world doesn't include people per se. The word world in the Bible means the system. So the quote unquote world of the system doesn't include people. It includes however, how it functions and flows and, and, and it's waiting on my, on me to rely on it, to put faith and trust in it. And that's why when the Bible says, lean not your own understanding. What it means is don't put your energy and your power into trusting your own understanding, but put your faith and trust and lean and your, and your energy into the things of Christ because he's the eternal one. He's the one that's going to be able to take care of you and, and be able to really be that person for you. And so that's really where we have to begin to, to understand what it means to be world, to say world. Because a person is not the world. A person is a human being, flesh and blood, made, let me, let me also say this to even back up more, made in the image and likeness of God.
And so because of that, know the difference. And so what I do in my, my ministry, my business, is to the world, which is humanity, not the world in the sense of what the Scripture says, which is the world's system. Because the system will always fail. And if I write something or say something towards or for the world's system, it's going to fail and my words will be in vain. And that's another reason why even when I think of politically, you know, and I, and, and I, and I don't adhere towards a certain president and worship a certain president like a lot of people do, or a certain party, because that's the world system. And, and when he deals with a system, if I put my faith and trust and lean my energy into something that is in the system, trying to correct and fix the system, I'm wasting my time, which is a disrespect to God because I'm putting, I'm putting the very faith and the very action of that part of something that is eternal and I'm placing it into a system that has been prophesied to me through God's word that it's going to fail anyway. So I'm wasting God's energy. I'm wasting God's time and talent and energy by doing that. And that's what I have to give an account before the Lord about is you wasted everything you put into the system which is destined to fail which is going to change in four to eight years anyway. So you wasted the things I gave you as opposed to building the kingdom that is inwardly and pulling that out within people a people. God is coming back for a people, not a president or government or country or nation. God doesn't have any favoritism. God doesn't say, I love America more than does Syria. Now, many of you are like, oh my God, don't say that. Well, I'm saying that from a point of view of the scripture. God is not a God of favoritism, the Bible says. God loves people, no matter who they are, what they are. And because of that, God looks out for people. And when the church does their job to serve people and not government, then guess what happens? We'll be, we'll be following New Testament believers and, and get out of our mindset out of the Old Testament where they had kings that rule. And in that time and the, and the place where the kings rule and the prophets were beginning to, to, and the prophets were sort of helping hand in hand with the kings, we also have to take with that the same thing that if you prophesy something wrong, you're stoned to death and put to death. Sorry folks, I don't want to be cursed with leprosy and stone, so I don't adhere towards an Old Testament belief system that God has made it plain to me has to go through the blood of Christ in the New Testament in order for it to be cleansed and purged and redefined of how now Christ has initiated for it to be on this planet. Because if I take it and and bring a type and shadow to something of the Old Testament, then I must take it all. James said it really plain. If you obey one one law, you're going to have to get yourself under every one of them. Because if not, you're double-minded. That's a key thing you have to understand. And so because of that, God is saying, don't be part of an of a exclusive group. Be a part that includes all. Be a part that you, whatever you are, like Paul, who gave the best example of what this represents, is to be all things to all people. So if Paul was alive today, Paul would be whatever he needs to be to us, to Syrians, to Iranians, to Jews, and to Muslims, and to Christians, and to black people, and to white people, and to gay people, and to straight people, and to Lebanese people, and to Chinese people, and to a Taiwan people. Why? Because he said, I'm all things to every person. That, my friend, is the kingdom that transcends past a ridiculous world system that many Christians have, have distorted their minds by getting involved involved in and and it distracts it because because Paul knew how to transcend past what the original Greek word means when it means with a world's system. He knew how to transcend that and say either one, I can be locked into a system and fight the system when every time I will know that I will not win because the world system is so faulty it cannot stand on its own. It can't stand period. And so because of that I'm going to transcend past that and be begin to bring forth a system that's called kingdom that cannot fail, that is eternal, that is infallible, that is perfect. And so his his job and duty was to bring forth all the Old Testament in the sense of the kings and the prophets and the, and all this other stuff. And it has to go through grace, through the blood of Jesus, in order for God to translate it and reinterpret it of what it means for us in our now moment, living out a New Testament theology that deals with New Testament believers. And because of that, I choose to take none of it, because if I'm under any of it, I have to be under all of it. And I choose to, to go through the blood, which means I choose to be able to be at the place where I focus on on, on, on good reports and good things, I begin to build manifestation of the kingdom because folks, whether we like it or not, in the Old Testament, the kingdom of God was not considered to be inside of people. 
And that's why they carried out the way they carried out things. And so when you cross it over into New Testament, where now everything is inwardly inside of us now, what you do is you distort the message of Christ and you literally begin to bring forth a borderline type of truthfully blasphemy. That's a hard word, but it's true. Because you're bringing forth something that is that is conducive to what you want versus everything that was outwardly that back in the Old Testament would kill you. And you're, and, and instead of translating that to the blood of Christ and bringing it to a, a, a place where it's now inwardly, and you're still trying to produce that outwardly, where you're trying to produce by changing the world system and bring, bring it outwardly, you've got to be very cautious because it's a deadly place to try it, a deadly place to go through, to go on. Why? Because the kingdom of God back in the day wasn't considered to be in people. Now it's considered to be in people. The fire of God was not in people, it was out of people, if you think about it. it you know, you had fire that showed up many times, fire by day and cloud by night. It was, it, it was external. Now it's internal. And we use that we pull that power from the Holy Spirit on the fire we see temples on the outside of us outer court inner court holy place now we are the temple so now it's made residence inwardly and so you've got to be careful with a lot of theology today that's pre and preach and taught especially in the prophetic charismatic move because it's representation of something that is brought over from Old Testament into the New Testament which it should not be done and then presented to a system trying to change a system that we are told to come out from among the system and be ye separate, says the Lord. Not even a prophet, not even a king, but says the Lord. Which means that if you try to bring this into, into a New Testament theology and you still try to extend it externally versus internally, then you're missing the message of Jesus and you're doing something that is out of Christ. Because the nature of Christ is to affect people People. And that's why the Bible even continues to say, man focuses on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Because it's the heart that God cares about, not who's president. And I'm going to say something that many of you probably wouldn't like. God really is not a big, God doesn't care about Biden nor Trump. Hello, I know you Trump worshipers. Or, or, or Oprah Winfrey or Hillary Clinton. What he cares about is each one of them equally in their heart to make sure that their heart is bowing to Him. And the key thing we have to be able to understand is God says in order for you to affect them is you don't fight the system because it's you're destined to fail. What you fight against is not flesh and blood, but against principalities. And the word principalities comes from the original language, which means principles, which, which is translated in the Greek as mindset. So we're dealing with going past the external, and once again, so eloquently put in the New Testament, he reiterates himself again by bringing it internally instead of externally, by letting us know you don't fight against something external, flesh and blood. And how many times do I wonder that Jesus and Paul have to keep on saying this to reiterate it over and over again in order for the church today to get a hold of the message of Christ and what he's trying to present and what he said through hundreds of scriptures in the New Testament. And then he brings forth from the external into the internal. You're not fighting against anything external. You're fighting against what is internal. And the only way to change what is internal is not begin to get out there, scream and shout and parade yourself. What's going to change that is living the Christ nature from the inside out and let your light so shine so other people can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So it's something that has to start inwardly to affect something outwardly. You can never begin to climb upstream and change it. It doesn't work that way. Gravity will begin to cause the rivers to flow downstream. That's what gravity does. And gravity is neither Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist or atheist. Gravity is the universal law that God has set into motion which basically says that things will begin to come down. <laughs> right? And so gravity pulls it down to planet Earth and thank God it does because I would not be alive if not. Which means it causes the rivers to always flow from a higher place into a lower place. And that's where you have to do understand that's how the kingdom is set up. It flows down from the Father of lights and in Him there's no shadow of turning. Which means it flows downwardly but then it flows inwardly. It never flows downwardly in into the world. It doesn't. That is that is not protocol of the kingdom. Where it flows into is it flows in, it comes down into us. Into us. What do we do with it when it flows into us? It activates the kingdom in us in order for us to begin to shine forth outwardly and begin to then let, let people see what we have learned to decrease in and allow God to increase in us, which is His grace, His love, His presence, His mercy, His compassion, His forgiveness, His feelings 
feeding the homeless, taking care of the widows. These, this is the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And therefore, we have to begin to understand what the message is saying. Anytime you fight against flesh and blood, you're always going to lose. Every single time. And they will, they will literally drown you and suck the life out of you until you're dead and gone. And that's why when we deal with New Testament, we have to understand that our message is not to us for no more. Our message is to the world, the planet, humanity, humanity. And if we don't, if we, if we, if we don't have a message in our businesses, in our triumphs, in our beliefs, in our teachings, in our whatever it is, if we don't have a message that is projected, that comes from the heart, projected outwardly as examples and expressions, here's the idea and understanding we have to get to. It's the understanding of expressions. It is the expression. When you begin to get into the expression of God, the expression of God, Expressions doesn't mean like a smirk or a smile. Expressions mean the expression of everything that's coming out of you that people can see. That people can understand of how you do things in difficult situations. How you do things in good situations. How you do things through death around you. How you deal with pressure. How you deal with sickness. How you deal with poverty. How you deal with riches. How you deal with anything. It's that expression that they're looking for. Because then they automatically know that will automatically change me or touch my life. Because we're seeing something that is coming from the inside outwardly. And anytime you feel as if you've got to make a change in the sense of screaming, shouting, hating, getting on somebody's side, you're automatically tagging yourself as having an unrenewed mind and you're siding with the side of the system of the world because God's kingdom has no sides. The world has sides and every day they beckon us, they call us. Isn't it interesting that even Democrats and Republicans, Republicans will ruin one another, each other? And yet we as Christians, as gullible as we are, we will fall for that and choose a side. The world system will always cause you to choose a side. That's its nature. That's the nature of the beast. Whose side do you want? Take my side. Even when people argue in your family, what do they do? I'm right, they're wrong. Whose side are you on? Because kingdom never says choose a side. What the kingdom of God says is when you're in king, the kingdom of light, there is no side to choose from. You either you you either decide that you are. I mean, when you think of the secular thing as far as being on the Lord's side or not on the Lord's side, you think of the kingdom of darkness representing the ignorance because we're so embedded into the world system. That's what the ignorance part of it represents. Versus the light that causes us to bring and a revelation to us to see. Wait a minute, I'm wasting my time trying to do stuff externally because this will never work and never has, never will, and I'm wasting God's precious anointing and time and presence and giftings and talents i'm wasting my expression on a system that will that will that cannot change because it will fail every time and therefore you you take months and years wasting the very precious life that god's given you when god says don't fight the battle is not yours the battle's mine the battle's mine the battle's mine And when you begin to understand that, you begin to come into the reality that God is saying, it's about you being the best expression you can of who you represent to the world in every area of your life and come out from a system that would try to disrupt you, destroy you, and cause you to choose a side. Because the world system will say this, you know, be for white people, not black people. Be for black people, not white people. Be for the Jews. And and, you know, and, and then be uh, be against you know Muslims. Be for Muslims. Be against Jews. Be for be for be for these people and not those people. Be, you know, don't worry, don't look, don't be for the minorities. Be for the majority. You know, or be for the minorities and then blame the majorities. Right? You know, be for those who choose this or those who choose that. The world will literally destroy you. Its its system is created to fragment you. And this is one thing I have to understand. It's the system is made to fragment you. And by choosing sides, you think out of the power of delusion that if I choose a side, that's the side of the Lord. It's never the side of the Lord in the system of this world. And I have news for every one of you. The Republicans is not the system of the Lord. 
And Democrats are not the system of the Lord. And yes, I'll say it. Trump is not the system of the Lord. And Biden is not the system of the Lord. Neither is anyone else. It is a heartfelt thing. It is a heartfelt thing. And we see the fruit that people bear. And that's what we go by. But even seeing people that bear forth fruit, we still keep our eyes on the prize of the high call, not on the flesh and blood that is producing the fruit. And this is where, my friend, you will be tossed to and fro by every one of doctrine every time you do this. And so when you hear someone say, whose side do you want? We should get on this side. Start fighting. Automatically you say, wait a minute. You, you've been sent to, you know, you've been sent to fragment me. You've been sent to frustrate me. You've been sent to get my anger stirred up. You've been sent to cause me to, to take myself out of the kingdom of heaven because I'm seated in heavenly places. You've been sent to get me down this earth and, bel- and belittle myself and be like David said in Psalms that says, man at his very best is nothing more than a beast. And so when people try to pull you into the system, we gotta fight. We gotta do this. We got, the moment you hear people do that, you recognize your are trying to destroy me. You're trying to fragment me. You're trying to cause me to choose a side that is going to be irrelevant because it's taking away from the precious time that I can spend with letting my light shine to the nations of the world. And that is to the widows, the homeless, and those that are starving, and those that are fed, and those that are poor, and to those that are rich. To the white, to the black, to everyone on this planet. That's who I'm called to do. Because I can't. Because I can sit here and say I'm in the world system and trying to change the world system, which God would look at us and totally laugh at. And we even see, even later on in, in, in we'll see the book of Revelation or New Testament, we'll see where he even says, it's not, you can't do that, right? Come on. And yet we still do something that God says, you can't do that. It's just going to get worse. And you, it, this is how they are. And yet you choose to, to get your feet wet in it. And yet God has already said, this is what happens. And you still get into it. And then what happens is we turn around then and when we rec- then we realize, you know what? Hold on. I am going to destroy myself if I am not careful to come out from among the side the choosing of the side getting my eyes on flesh and blood as if someone's the master the savior the the leader of the leaders and get into a place where I understand the king of kings and lord of lords he's the one that guides and directs the hearts of man once their life once their hearts are changed and then he begins to woo us all into the place of unity and love and no more comparison and no more choosing sides and no more fragmentation but coming together in unity to say I love my brother isn't that what the book of Genesis start off with and isn't that what the book of Revelation ends with? Where the lion will finally, once more, lay with the lamb. Which means this, at the end of the day, all these choosing sides will one day lay together. But it can't be done by you. It can't be done by any flesh and blood. It must be done only by the choosing of, of ourselves in the sense of pulling the plank out of our own eye, focusing on working out my own salvation and dealing with my own heart to where it does, doesn't become a heart of stone, but, be, but continues to keep itself as a heart of flesh and then begin to understand that through this heart of flesh, I can begin to decrease, let God increase in me, shine my light and begin to do the, the, the damage that needs to be done to the system which is what? By basically giving them grace, love, compassion. How do we know that? Because the Bible says this. It says, love your enemies. It's so fun to say, oh, I can love my neighbor because, oh my God, she's spirit-filled and she goes to my church. Oh, I just love her to death. And God's like, okay, here's the deal what you're going to do. Love your neighbor. The Buddhist, the Muslim, the gay person, the, the Lebanese, the, the, the Hindu. You love that neighbor because if you don't love them, you can't love yourself. And if when you truly learn to love yourself, you won't care about trying to bring forth, you know, what side are you on? People, let me say something to each one of you. And I want you to hear me by the Spirit of God. When you are trying to find a side to, to be on, psychology says this. When you try to find a side to, 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 to be on, it shows your low self-esteem. But more importantly, it shows your lack of identity. If your identity is in Christ, you don't need a side, folks. If your identity is in Christ, you don't need to choose a side that the system of this world is begging you to do. Because the moment you do that, you're proving to yourself, I have no idea what my identity is. And I must begin to run into someone, a group, or something that accepts me. Isn't it interesting how businesses and ministries, and we do it, but isn't it interesting how business and ministries will say stuff like, Hey, we have, we want you to be part of our group, our club, our membership thing, you know, be part of our program. And that's fine and dandy, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, however, it can get to the place where you're not careful. 
Where, and, and this is why people do this. You know why people do this? Because they understand the concept. Businesses structure or understand the concept that people want to feel needed. They want to feel like they're part of something. And so no wonder why the Republicans and Democrats and Trump and Biden and all these people we just become puppy dogs to and really disproven how dumb we can be by basically saying, oh, they're wanting me to be a part of them. And we're, and we're like puppy dogs that return back to the, to the vomit by running after that. Because what we're saying is, I just want to be a part of something. When the, when the truth is, folks, you don't need to be on a, a part of something, fighting for something, fighting for someone. Because the moment you do that, you prove that you've lost your identity and you just want to be accepted in love. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be accepting in love. But here's where it becomes wrong. When you forget, I'm already accepted and I'm already loved by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't need the system to, talk, to, to pull me into something where they can give me a false love. By making them, by making them, by making me feel as if that their persona is actually nurturing and healing me. That's what happens. Psychology will tell you when you feel you can't wait to be a part of something, a group, which once again, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that things are, that you're a bad person. But the truth is humanity wants to be a part of something when you're fragmented and you're lost. And if you feel, I just want to be a part of this and this and this and this and this, what happens is you're showing and proving yourself that you don't, you don't know your own identity and you're not comfortable with you being around and surrounded by the company God has already given you from Him. Find your security in Him. Find your side in Him. Find your power in Him and, and, and allow yourself to come out from a system that is begging you, that is pleading with you. Join me. Be on my side. Be on my team. We can defeat them. We can tell them how hateful they are. And yet the other side, exact same thing. They're trying to hurt us. They're trying to destroy us. And you know what? We as ignorant Christian people fall for that every single time. It's like, you know, the old saying, and you think, you know, there's no movie that this happened and somebody said, you sucker. And the thing is, I'm thinking, you know what? That's what we become suckers when we begin to dive into and, and lower ourselves into believing lies that that's all they can produce in the system of the world is nothing but lies. That's all they, that's all the system can do for you, folks. Don't follow man. I don't care how high and powerful they are or how lowly they are. Don't follow people. Follow God. He will never let you down. He'll never forsake you, forsake you or leave you. He's the one that can guarantee you that he will never cause you to choose a side in him. There's not a side, there's not two sides in God. There's only one side, right? He'll never cause you to turn your back on enemies. He'll never cause you to sit here and when he tells you to love them. He'll never cause you to say, hey, I want you to tell these people how rotten and horrible they are and, 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 and run to me. No, what he'll do is he'll say, here's what you're going to do. See that neighbor over there? Don't ask what they believe. Go and feed them. Hey, you see that? See that person over here? Oh, God, I hate them for what they did to me. No, no, no. You, you, you don't love them. That's why we hear stories of people who have had their children murdered or molested or raped, and they find their kids in the cornfields dead. And what is the challenge of that mother or father? The challenge with anything, a part of them, their human nature is want to choose a side. I'm against them. I hate them. I hope they burn and rot, you know, burn in hell forever. But the other side that has no side, is the side that's pure love that says, in order for you to not be toxic in your life and destroy the rest of your life, you've got to learn to forgive. And the moment you forgive, you you no longer choose a side. And I want you to hear me closely, folks. You no longer choose a side. The only side is that there is no side. Because that side is a side of pure love and forgiveness and compassion. And the moment you get on that side, you realize I'm actually not on a side. I'm in the truth. Truth is not a side. Truth is something that sets us free and liberates us. And it doesn't ask for to choose a side. Because the moment you get into truth, it says, I don't care about a side. I don't even care about who hates you or who's for you or against you. I don't care. What it does is you get into truth to find out I've got to love and, and forgive and set my Self free from that side they're trying to get me to be on. And the moment you do, the truth sets you free for eternity. So I really hope today this, this podcast was a blessing to you. I actually was going to talk about my new book and something in my spirit just kept on pulling me and tugging me to begin to bring this message forth. And I'm really glad I did because I always want to be spirit led. But more importantly, I want to begin to 
to give you guys something of what God is wanting to say to somebody out there saying, you know what, wow, Jeremy, I didn't realize how worldly I really was, and yet I've been speaking in tongues, claiming the scriptures, running on the side of God, and now I realize there's no side of God. Let me just say this to you before I close. God does not need you to defend him. He doesn't get offended. He's not going to be mad. I mean, God, that's not the nature of God. The nature of God is not saying, be on my side or I'm going to cry. No. The nature of God is, you know what? I'm going to woo you by my loving kindness until your heart changes. I'm going to love you regardless how much you might hate me or hate somebody else. Because I don't have a side. I am just pure love. And once you get into love, you don't need a side. So I wanted today to say, whoever these, these, this message is for, I, we have thousands of listeners, but how many hundreds of people, maybe even thousands, this message is for, definitely write into us. Let us know how much these pod, this podcast means to you. Get into this. And let me just say this to you as well. Is a lot of you today, and I don't know why, because I'm not a political person, I'm like, God, why am I going, always going back to the political side? And God said, because I want my people free. I want people free. They've been so sucked up into the system, they forgot who I am and what they serve and what their commission is to do. The Bible says your commission is to go out into the world and make disciples. Instead, we say that's not good enough. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make the disciples of a system. And God's like, never gonna happen. You're wasting your time and energy. And you're not, and, and, and which means you're not pleasing to me, for lack of better words, because you're, you're, you're doing things that is really irrelevant, you know? And so whoever these are for, please Please do us a favor. Write into the ministry. I would love to hear from you. I really would. And uh, and you can write in by uh, the, our email at the ministry is customer service at identitynetwork.net. Customer service at identitynetwork.net. And some of this stuff today might be triggers for some of you. You might be like, oh my gosh, you triggered me because I'm so involved in this. And that's fine. And you know what? Grace, grace, my friend. I still love you. Definitely, I love you. But let me just say this. Let those triggers speak to you. Let those triggers awaken you to where you understand that all the frustration, the fear, the fighting, and yet God's like, you're wasting your energy, wasting your time. It's not against flesh and blood. And so this is where you have to understand, let this speak to you and set yourself free and choose the Christ of the scriptures that says it's about the kingdom and what the definitions of the kingdom does in us and from us. And I promise you, you will be at so much more peace than you've ever, ever known in your whole entire life because it's not the peace of the, of the, the political party that brings you, you know, uh, that soothes your lack of understanding. It is the peace of Christ. That transcends past everything else on this planet. So remember that today. And oh, by the way, as I was going to say, by the way, my new book for this month of, um, the month of May is actually creating an atmosphere of peace. So what better topic should I talk about today than that of peace? So go to the website right now, identitynetwork.net, and when you do, just put in creating an atmosphere of peace. And when you do, go ahead and purchase it today, the book. I'll autograph it for you if I'm in the office, uh, and or you can just download the book and purchase that, the, the ebook. But either way, this book will give you points and scriptures and everything else to bring you back to the place where your life can be full full of peace and you can throw anxiety out the front door finally. So thank you so much for tuning into our podcast. And as always, I want to say this to each one of you. I love you dearly. I truly love you. No matter who you are, what you believe, you're important, you're a human being, and and you know what? And God loves you. That that's all that needs to be said. Right? Because I don't have to tell you, you know, everything that deals with, you know, right and wrong and you gotta, you better straighten up and do this. You know what? Cause that's not my job. I don't want to take away from the Holy Spirit's job. And the Holy Spirit's job is to will you, to, to, to lead you to the things that you know that God wants you to be able to be led into. It's not my job to do that. My job is to teach the kingdom and to share from God's standpoint of love. And I don't want to be the Holy Spirit. I don't want to have that position. That, that's too much for me to handle, right? And so I just want you to know today, I love each one of you. I don't judge any of you at all. I truly don't. And I will see you and respect you as a human being because of what I want to do is just display the light of God to you and let the power of Christ just renew you however that looks without me interjecting my opinion to that. And as always, I'll close with this, that... If you don't like your day, I have great news for you. You can restructure how you're thinking right now and your entire, the rest of your entire day will automatically change. God bless you. This has been the Thoughts Become Things podcast with Jeremy Lopez, helping you reach your highest creative potential that God has for you. 
For more episodes, products, and information on Jeremy, visit www.identitynetwork.net.